Right, um, do you want to pronounce this next name? Yeah, sure. Um, so the next question is from... Dariah Proximova. Thank you, Jamie. And he asked, what experience is the same for all Oxford students, and which one is different for everybody? Okay, well I think the experience which is the same is that you are going to be constantly in a state of anxiety about work. Yeah, you'll have deadlines, and then you'll be like, able to cope with those deadlines. Yeah, you're going to be anxious about it and stressed, but you're going to be okay with that anxiety yeah. and stress. Um, what's different for everybody? Okay, I think just purely by de definition that if you're a different person, you're going to have a different experience, yeah. thus everything you do is going to be different. Because there's such a wealth of things for you to get engaged with, your narrative for Oxford is going to be completely different. I mean, the, like, it's like completely it, different. It's like how uh, the Olympic Games is completely different for different athletes in different sports. You know, if you're doing a different subject, it's a completely different experience. And equally, if it depends what you also do in your time. It's not just your subject, it's whether you do, if you choose to spend your time doing sport or music, or in my case, um, seeing your girlfriend. I mean, I, I was in a long distance relationship for the first three years of uni, and that completely changed my experience because, mm -hmm. you know, um, for, for, compared to somebody who was always in Oxford. Um, it's, diff it's, it's, impossible to, it's impossible to say, really. You know, yeah. ev everyone is different, which is a great thing. Hello? Is it? I think it is. Mm. <laughs> ben Claridge has asked, how much has Oxford changed your life? How would your life be different if you went to any of your other uni choices? Mm. It's difficult to say, really. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that... That's incredibly difficult, because we don't know what the counterfactual would be, right? I yeah. mean, you're the one who has the closest comparison, because you're here now. Yeah! So you can, like, spy on undergraduates and see how they're growing as people. I, I mean, I think the comparison is that if I'd gone to another university, uh, I'd be less stressed, because the Oxford term is compressed. You know, it's, it does, it's eight weeks instead of 11 or 12. Mm -hmm. So you do the same amount of work at the universities, but it's just spread out more. So people in Exeter, for example, are a lot more chilled. Um, and the other big thing is, we, I mean, I showed Jamie around yesterday, uh, the fact that it's a campus university changes the dynamic of university hugely. Mm -hmm. um, I think if I'd gone to a campus uni like, um, I'm mean, Durham is also collegiate, but you know, like Warwick or like Leeds, I think it would have really changed how I perceived my, my student experience, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I think in a way I would have preferred it, weirdly, because I, I like the idea of having everything in one place and having mm -hmm. like the student hub, whereas in Oxford it's like, we were talking about this yesterday, yeah. it's like yeah. islands in Oxford of, of student... Oh yeah, he gave it a great name, it was the, the archipelago of, of education, Yeah, which is fantastic. There you go, that's just about your, oh, Oxford's new tagline. Um, what do you think? Um, how does it change my life? I would say it's given me far more belief in my own abilities to be able to, regardless of how intense the situation is, be able to cope with it. And upon having now left Oxford and now being in the working world, the working world is so easy in comparison. <laughs> like, the amount of workload that is expected of you is so much lower than what Oxford expects of you. So you're ramping it up at like that, and this is casual sailing for you, whereas like the average is kind of expected about that. So. I would say that that is a huge skill that Oxford has changed for me in particular. And I would say that it is distinct from other unis because from having spoken to people from other unis aside from Cambridge, um, even the ones in America, when the Stanford kids come over, the Harvard kids come over to Maudlin and they're like, how do you get all of this stuff done? It just, <laughs> the fact that you've been prepared in such a way and you know that what you've been grilled through over the past three or four years is at that standard, that gives you a kind of sense of belief that I don't think I'd have otherwise. Oh. Nilani has asked, how much did college life influence your time at uni? Massively. Like, my, co my time in college was my time in uni, basically. Yep, pretty much the same for me. Okay, cool. Next. E. Brian says, as a result... <laughs> what does he say? As a result of people going to Oxford, how did you find people reacted to you going to Oxford? And did they treat you differently? They did treat me differently. Okay, so I've discovered there are two types of people. One type of person is they're impressed by the fact that you go to Oxford and then they respect you intellectually. Um, another type of person is more, okay, so you went to Oxford, but what else have you done? Yeah. That's the kind of person you want to talk to more. Yeah, that's the type of person I like because I just saw Oxford as a stepping stone. I don't want it to be my entire identity. Yeah. Um, people do, I mean, sometimes it is nice when people treat you differently. It can be, can help you. You know, especially especially in work stuff. In terms of negative, um, like if we've been perceived negatively for the fact that we've gone to Oxford, I don't. Think
think so. Some of it's been teasing, like, oh, I wanted to go to Oxford, or oh, okay. You must be posh. Yeah, you must yeah. be posh is one of the big things. But which is exactly why we do not... some of the work that we do to try and yeah. to get rid of these stereotypes. But yes, both good and bad, basically. Yeah, predominantly good. Yeah. Okay. Hamza um, Wahid has asked. I heard a rumor that for Oxford you basically need ninety percent A star grades at GCSE. I got seven A stars, two A's and a B from a school where only fifty percent of students got five GCSEs. You're going to be absolutely fine. <laughs> not guarantee you're going to get in, but those are yeah. good results. But the thing is, Oxford t- take into account how good your results are relative to the average performance of someone at your school. Mm-hmm. So it, th- obviously that's amazing for your school. So don't worry about because that's going to look better than somebody who went to say Eton but only got eight A stars, for example. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's still fine. Okay. And then Casper asks about big fish, little fish, big pond, small pond theory. Which essentially, is it better to be a big fish in a small pond, or is it better to be a normal sized fish or a small fish in a very, very large pond? And to what extent does that influence your performance as an individual? I'm not sure what I think about this. I don't know. I, 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 like, basically, he's asking would you, as an employer, do you think you'd, you'd choose someone who was a top student at a average ranked university or someone who's an average student at a top ranked university for a role? Um, I honestly don't know. Okay, so I live by the premise that you should always be the dumbest person in the room because otherwise you aren't learning as fast as you could be learning. And so when I was, went to Oxford, I think that affected me in that, no, I was average as opposed to being the best in my old school. And that just surrounded me by people and gave me, continued my hunger to want to learn. However, I can definitely see why people would be demotivated by, oh, I'm no longer the best, so there's no point in trying because I'm never going to be the best again. I think the other thing is that if you spend a long time being a big fish in a small pond, mm-hmm. uh, being at the top of everything, you turn into a prick pretty easily. Um, and basically, you don't. Or want rather, to work you with... become complacent as opposed to you become a prick. I think there's <laughs> definite element. There's elements of dickishness. I think that creep into your personality. Uh, I don't think that happened to me. I don't think. Well, no, but I think. I think if it was at university, I think. I think because because for school, it's not for as long. For, if you say for six for six form, which was like seven years. Well, no, for, for six form, I wasn't. Oh right, yeah, I had high school that was linked to the same six form for yeah. seven years. So I mean, I, I don't know. I think at uni, it's very possible to think you're the best thing since sliced bread can in sealed packages, and I think that can affect your personality quite. Stay slowly. humble, stay hungry. That and what Steve Jobs is Stanford speed. My fronter said, "How was your freshers' week? Most interesting stories from both of you, please." <laughs> yeah, um, my freshers' week was alright. Um, I was ill I for most of it. Yeah, for most of it. So I was just kind of recovering and trying to make friends without having a voice because I lost it in four hours. My predominant memory was um, getting acquainted instantly with all the people on my corridor. Who I lived on a corridor of musicians, and musicians are, are really fun. Um, and I remember on like the, the night after I met this guy, engaging in a race of um, wheelbarrow shots. Where you you were with a person mm-hmm. and they you you carried the person who was the wheelbarrow and they went on their hands. They had to then do a shot and then you you changed over, did the same thing again. It was like a relay. Oh god! And I'd met this the guy like twelve hours before. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. <laughs> oh, Freshers Week was a lot of fun. I love Freshers Week. And then I got given this worksheet uh-huh. by the tutors and um, we said to the second year, she was like, "Oh, is this what we're supposed to do like every week then?" And we'd be like, they just laughed at us. <laughs> oh, like, only, only one. Thank <laughs> you. Andrew has asked, did you either of you ever meet a member of the Bullingdon Club? You? Maybe. I was in a queue at St. Hugh's Ball and there were a bunch of, I probably can't say that word on YouTube, uh, not very nice people uh, in front of me who were just really talking down a lot of the stuff which was happening at this ball. And um, I just got, I sort of realised afterwards, I was like, oh, they were probably members of the Bullingdon Club because they were wankers. Oh, <laughs> God, okay. So I did. Oh, did um, you? Oh. Yeah, but it's kind of, it's not really a true answer. So I met George Osborne because he came to give a talk at Maudlin because he's an ex-alum of Maudlin and he was apparently in the club. Yeah, I can imagine. And for those of you who don't know, the Bullingdon Club is a club for apparently the, the best and brightest young men to partake in raucous activities and drinking and debauchery in general. Otherwise known as the scum of the, the private school system, pretty much. The, the really... Some of them might be nice. Some of them might be nice, but they, don't, get a, they don't have a good name for themselves. Let's put it no, like that. No, okay, yeah. So the reputation of the club infers that this is what type of individuals are that. Yeah. There we go. That's okay. the, we, 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 we're probably going to be sued now. Don't sue her, please. 
We don't have the money. <laughs> We're not like you, we don't have the money. <laughs> Young relativist has asked, what's your advice for someone from Africa who wants to get a scholarship, especially if that someone doesn't have any particular degree? Uh, there is a fantastic university search tool um, for scholarships and funding, which we will include on the screen now. And because YouTube's changed the way it works, you can't click on that, but there is a link in the description. Um, that is for anybody, if, you, you know, if you're looking at any kind of funding or grants, you put in your information and it will tell you what's available. Um, yeah. And that can actually influence your choice of college because there's some some colleges have really really specific grants like mm -hmm. somebody who's under twenty mm -hmm. from New Zealand who wants to study history yeah and there's a specific grant for that there's one in the UK that your mum mother has to be a chemist and your father has to be a baker and then you get the scholarship <laughs> and I was like dad can Mark you change your jobs and then all my tuition fees are paid for uh, uh, the next question my middle name's Jane It'll be thank you for that personal insight and your question is. Just about to start uh, first year Natsuki, sorry for your last. Uh, and about specializing physics, good. You kind of redeemed yourself in my eyes. Um, the philosophy. Uh, what did you think you'd end up doing when you first started at Oxford? Is it better to study an entirely new subject that interests you, or one that you're more likely to do much? And I think you get better in. much better in. Mm. When I started at Oxford, I thought I was going to go into fusion research. Right. Um, because I thought that there's lots of physics like, to be answered, and there kind of isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. Like most of fusion is just engineering. So yeah. I, I was like, nope, not interested. Oh. And then I, um, the, the reason I got into atmospheric science is because I did a third year course on fluid mechanics and flows, mm -hmm. and I was I just really liked the first time in my life I looked at a bit of maths and was like, I really like this maths. Uh, and and I've always been a big conservationist and I'm really passionate about the environment, and so kind of natural mm -hmm. environment too. So I, I went on a completely different trajectory. Okay. Um, I thought I'd focus lots on economics, and then I discovered oh, actually economics is stupid <laughs> because it's the economy is stupid. We have we have all of these models and all these assumptions that don't really work. So constantly, I was finding what I was learning wasn't actually helpful in modeling, and I'd have to go very very advanced before I get to something that was really going to be teaching me valuable skills. So I opted for the philosophy and the politics instead. Because philosophy teaches you how to think, and politics helps you understand the world in which you exist in, and I think those two things are very important. Oh wait, we should end this one in some- we should have some sort of outro. Should we? Well- Should this be our outro? We could have this as our outro. Welcome okay. to the outro. So Thank you is, for watching the video. This is the end of this Q&A video. We will see you next week for another video. This is the end of one. This that was, that was so end. unenthusiastic. This is the end of the next. Because this still be the outro. Yeah, and this, this is, is the out. end of the, the next one that we do if we break it up into three parts. There we go. There we go, right. Should we just start we start go. And then personal. you can just cut those yeah. and then put them <laughs> accordingly. Okay, we're oh. so professional. Every finger a dagger, every, every arm and leg a spear, and your mind a sword. Which is good for martial arts. I am my own weapon.